Okay, Fargo Herpetological Society is having our guest speaker a week late due to some technical difficulties. Uh, video conference in and talk, and we will be broadcasting this on YouTube and sharing on Facebook and around the internet. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Johan Marais yeah, from South Africa. South Africa. Been involved with um, a bit of feedback there. Any part of the game? Are you getting any feedback your side? I think I okay. just ended it. I, I mute my microphone and it stops the feedback. Okay. So, yeah, uh, Johan Marais. I've been um, involved with reptiles pretty much most of my life. Grew up in Durban, now live in Gauteng in South Africa. Um, I've um, written 11 books, busy with another five at the moment, uh, involved in quite a bit of research with um, Wits University, uh, with Aaron Bauer at the University of Villanova, and also work with, um, uh, with the guys from Sam Houston State University. Great. How did you get started in reptiles? I grew up in, um, Durban is a coastal town in South Africa. It's the, the weather is subtropical. So I had a bit of exposure to the odd snake as a kid and uh, also spent quite a bit of my time on farms with relatives in interesting areas, the Northern Cape, parts of um, Pumalanga. And again, you know, got some exposure to snakes and started catching snakes at a young age and it sort of developed from there. Now, I did a little research on you before I asked you to guest speak, and I read that you were uh, or are a member of the Crocodile Specialist Group. What's that entail? Well, I, you know, the Crocodile Specialist Group is part of IUCN, um, and um, back in 1985, after a, a stint at uh, the old Transvaal Snake Park in Halfway House near Johannesburg, I uh, spent the next eight years farming crocodiles at uh, various commercial crocodile farms. And um, it was sort of, those were pioneering days. The farmers were experiencing really high mortality. Uh, they knew a little bit about husbandry. Uh, they were really struggling with uh, incubating eggs and um, getting the animals just to, to breed. Um, so I got involved with the crocodile specialist group and uh, I got involved with the University of Pretoria. And we were doing quite a, quite a bit of work on crocodile nutrition we, we traveled the USA and spoke to a lot of the fish guys, a lot of the alligator guys, and um, then got involved with uh, incubation and uh, hatchling diets, uh, enclosure design. Yeah, so for the next eight years, um, put out quite a lot of papers and got really involved, spoke at a lot of the crocodile specialist group conferences in places like Tampa, Zimbabwe, and uh, Pattaya in Thailand. Sounds like you've been on a lot of ground floor kind of groundbreaking information. Uh, do you enjoy this startup research knowing that so many others are probably going to base their start on some of the stuff that you did? Oh, yeah, very much so. You know, so the, the, the crocodile stuff was a lot of fun and um, we quickly got on top of it too. You know, initially the, with hatchlings, for instance, the guys were experiencing about a 90% mortality with hatchling crocodiles in South Africa, uh, also in other parts of Southern Africa. And uh, within about two years, we got it down to about a 4% mortality. Um, then the guys were having a lot of problems growing them up quick enough and uh, playing around with diets. We found a few really good diets, and uh, we got that uh, really sorted out quite quickly. Um, I was looking at um, fertility and hatchability of eggs, and again, we got really good results quite quickly. But uh, then I got out of the commercial croc farming scene and um, back to sort of doing reptile surveys, uh, looking at biogeography, and um, I work with some of the top guys in the world, so it's, uh, it's really good stuff. And uh, just spent about seven years working in Namibia, looking at what's going on with their reptiles there. And a lot of this work was done with uh, Professor Aaron Bauer. And uh, we are now busy with a book on the reptiles and amphibians of Namibia. So yeah, I, I enjoy scratching around and doing new stuff. And the new frontier for us is Angola. I've just spent a few weeks up there with Dr. Bill Branch. And uh, we'll have to be back there with Aaron Bauer in the near future. I've looked up a lot of your books online, um, and I was going to order a couple of them. Is there specific ones uh, you find are maybe easier reads than others out of the ones you've written? Yeah, I think that the top-selling book at this stage is the Complete Guide to Snakes of Southern Africa, 
um, you know, for a for a, the South African market is really small, um, and uh, that book is available in English and Afrikaans. And um, to give you an idea of how small our market is, if you can sell about three, four thousand copies of a book in South Africa, it's regarded as a bestseller. And uh, that book has now exceeded sixty-five thousand sales. Um, the snakes, uh, the, the snakes and snake bite book has, has sold about thirty-five thousand copies. But I'm busy rewriting that at the moment, so a whole new edition of that will come out soon. And then the other book that's a really good read is um, is uh, the uh, guide to reptiles of Southern Africa that I did with Aaron Bauer. Sorry, that I did with Graham Alexander, and that's also selling really good. So that, I guess the guide to reptiles as well as um, the uh, snakes, the uh, complete guide to snakes, those are the two top ones at the moment. Sounds good. Those are actually the two I was looking at. Um, yeah. So your uh, I know you have a lot of experience with venomous. Our society, we're in a, a very, very northern part of the United States here. The only active venomous snake anywhere near our area is a, a timber rattlesnake, which is kind of a, a lower end of the rattlesnakes. But uh, So we don't really promote keeping venomous a whole lot. Um, we're, we're right on the border of two states, and one that you can't keep venomous, the other does allow venomous, um, but we don't really promote it a lot for liability and the responsibility that goes along with keeping venomous, but um, I see you do a lot of education on handling venomous and things like that. Do you kind of have a soft spot for the venomous reptiles, or is it that there's just so many down there? Well, it's uh, it's quite complex, you know. Uh, I'm not really involved in the um, in, with snakes in captivity. Uh, I don't really keep snakes, and I'm not very involved in uh, reptile husbandry. I did that many years back, and um, I just don't really have the time for it. But what does happen in South Africa is that uh, in the various uh, provinces, we have um, different laws, and by and large, the majority of provinces allow the keeping of, of venomous, venomous snakes, uh, indigenous venomous snakes under permit, although in some provinces like KwaZulu-Natal you don't even require a permit. But because of the some of the restrictions on the keeping of, of venomous snakes, um, we've had a massive influx of deadly exotics coming into South Africa. And it's estimated that we have between 80 and 100 deadly exotic species in captivity. Um, most of them without permits, uh, as they're not required. And the part that worries us is that uh, the majority of these people have no access to antivenom. That's sort of pretty problematic, and the various provinces are looking at legislation at this stage. Um, the main reason for my involvement with, uh, with venomous snakes is that I do a lot of safety training for corporates, for mines all over Africa. And um, I'm also a FAGASA-approved service provider. That's our Field Guides Association of Southern Africa. So I tend to train up quite a bit of um, sort of game ranges and field guides. But most of this training is really more about the safe removal of, of venomous snakes because we do have, you know, about species. About a dozen of them are considered deadly. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit there. Was that 50 species that are considered deadly? Devin, I'm not, uh, I'm not hearing you. Uh, 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 now, about of the 170 species. odd species and subspecies in southern Africa, about a dozen, about 12 of them are considered deadly. Okay, yeah, our internet connection, there was a little bit of a lag, but I just got that. Okay. Besides the, you know, removal of the venomous and the proper handling that you teach, do you do any, th there's a lot of work out there right now with, uh, you know, using the venom for medical research or gathering it, for, you know, for anti-venom work and stuff like that. Do you do any uh, venom gathering for stuff like that? Uh, no, not at this stage. There's no real demand for uh, for venom, except for wormslung venom, which they desperately need for the production of anti-venom. But um, I am in touch with um, a lot of people in the USA, Europe, and Australia. Um, so where there is a demand for, for venom for experimental purposes, I'd happily get involved with it. 
Um, in South Africa, right now, there's no real research going on with the use of um, venom for for uh, the treatment of, of illnesses. Uh, most of that work has been done elsewhere, but not in this country. If you had to pick your favorite reptile, what would it be? Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, we have incredibly attractive and interesting reptiles in South Africa. I think as far as snakes go, I've always had a really soft spot for green mambas. Um, they actually uh, confined to coastal areas, usually within a few miles of the sea, from southern KwaZulu-Natal northwards into Mozambique. Um, they're just really attractive snakes, very shy, very elusive. Um, but in some of the areas where they're abundant, uh, they are encountered quite often. So you were recent, You recently took a pretty good bite. Uh, you want to maybe tell some people about that? Yeah, yeah. I guess one uh, in the USA they call them uh, uh, what are they call it equipment failures. Um, during training with puff adders, I will often show the try and show the people how quickly these snakes strike because they're really incredibly fast. And um, in some snake handling, people will often make the mistake of using a hook stick and tailing the puff adder, which is a really bad idea because they can spin around and, and, and strike incredibly fast. So showing the, the sole of my, my boot to, um, to a puff adder to show people how quickly it strikes, and it actually uh, missed the sole and went through the side of the boot, and one fang got me uh, on the instep of my foot. Um, not a, a very bad bite. I w did receive a fair amount of venom. I was hospitalized for about a, a week, spent another week in bed, had a lot of swelling on the foot, but fortunately I didn't need uh, anti-venom and I also uh, didn't have any necrosis of the foot. Okay. Uh, what are the common uh, like symptoms of that type of venom exactly? Well, both uh, we have two our two most uh, snakes that are involved in the majority of serious snake bites in southern Africa is the puff adder and the Mozambique spitting cobra, and both these snakes have um, predominantly cytotoxic venoms, and uh, a bite would result in immediate pain. It's like standing on, stepping onto a really massive thorn, uh, followed by um, a lot of swelling, and um, the swelling would uh, extend up the limb quite quickly in severe cases and if that swelling extends more than about 15 centimeters per hour up an arm or a leg we would seriously consider administering antivenom and um, in South Africa we have a polyvalent antivenom that is um, highly effective against these bites and the initial dosage in a, a Papilla or Mozambique spinning cobra bite would be in the region of about 80 to 100 milliliters injected intravenously. So you're talking about 8 to 10 vials. And in some bites, it'll even go double that. So the swelling would then extend up the limb. Uh, in, in bad bites, we see massive swelling. And within hours, we see severe blistering. And um, in a lot of those bites, we have to see a lot of necrosis, uh, massive skin damage, especially bites on the hand or fingers. Uh, you'd see severe necrosis, and these bites do often result in the loss of limbs. I know I've heard stories about some people having bad reactions to the antivenom itself. Um, do you have some of that with those types of antivenoms over there? Yes, sadly, we have a lot of bad reactions uh, with our antivenom, um, and um, probably in about 50% of cases where people receive the antivenom, there is some sort of allergic reaction, but we also see a fair number of severe allergic reactions where people are going to fill on anaphylaxis, and um, in those cases, adrenaline will have to be administered really urgently. Uh, but it's a bit of a myth that uh, we have large numbers of deaths from shock and from the allergic reaction to the antivenom. If um, doctors have the uh, adrenaline on hand and they use it well, uh, they can counter the allergic reactions or the anaphylactic reactions quite successfully. And uh, the, in the one study that I looked at where we had over 2,000 people hospitalized, about 
20% of them received antivenom. And of those 2,000 people, uh, only one person um, suffered severely from anaphylaxis. In fact, it was, there was one death from anaphylaxis of those 2,000 bites, and that death was probably preventable if it was better managed. Sounds like you have it down to an art form almost. Yeah, we, we, um, we have some doctors that are exposed to a lot of bites and uh, one of the doctors that I work with sees over 400 serious snake bites every year and these are rural people that come from quite far and uh, it might even take them up to 16 hours to be hospitalized. So uh, we do have pretty good exposure to how, how effective the antivenom is, what the side effects are and, and, uh, and how to really look after these patients. What's the deadliest snake in your area of South Africa? Well, I think, uh, you know, the black mom is, I don't really see it as just the deadliest snake in the area. I still see it as one of the deadliest snakes in the world. Having, um, having worked with taipans and king cobras and tropical rattlesnakes and a whole bunch of other snakes. The problem with the black mom is, is that the average snake is around sort of three meters in length. Uh, they do get uh, over four meters in length. They um, have an incredibly potent neurotoxic venom. And um, they also, uh, they, they, they're not really aggressive as people often think, but they're incredibly nervous. So they're quick to, to bite if cornered. They might give multiple bites, and they have the ability to inject large, mass, uh, large quantities of venom in a single bite. And if you pick up a really serious black mamba bite, or a, a Cape Cobra bite for that matter, you could have serious problems with breathing within about 15 to 30 minutes. I've also heard black mambas are quite fast. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a bit of a myth, you know, the, the maximum speed of a black mamba is certainly uh, no faster than anyone having a good run. Um, and not that snakes ever chase people, but you could certainly outrun any, any black mamba. Um, if you look at striking speed, puffers strike a lot quicker than black mambas. I think the big problem is that if you're working in a confined area, if, if you, for instance, walk into a small storeroom on a farm and you have a black mamba cornered and uh, it can't easily escape, then you're in big trouble. And they would then lift their heads off the ground, they spread a narrow hood, they have the mouth open, exposing the black interior, and uh, once you get them to that stage, they won't hesitate to bite. Then, you're, then you could be in big trouble. Okay. What's, uh, we've been talking a lot about venomous. Uh, what kind of non-venomous snakes are there in your area? Well, if you look at, uh, from, a, from a keeping in captivity point of view, we have a lot of incredible specials, you know, very attractive snakes like uh, the Aurora house snakes, uh, the various tiger snakes. A lot of the lesser venomous, like some of the small adders, are really popular in, um, in the pet trade. But I think if you look at the completely harmless stuff, we have some really, really nice snakes. Uh, one of our most common snakes is the brown house snake, and it's, um, it's a bit like a corn snake. It's really easy to keep. They're attractive. Uh, they're really popular. But because of the restrictions that we have uh, in a lot of provinces on keeping indigenous snakes, uh, a lot of the keepers switch to exotics. So you'd find that the exotics are, are far more popular in the pet trade than indigenous snakes. Speaking of the house snake, uh, one thing I, I've actually done a little research on them, one thing I've heard is uh, that a lot of people like is they can have multiple clutches of eggs a year, which a lot of snakes can't do. Yes, that is um, that is sort of pretty fortunate and we have that with quite a few of our snakes, even uh, the attractive tiger snakes of the of the genus Telescopus can also have multiple clutches and you have sperm, re sperm retention in them. So you could actually have um, breeding in you know in two years in a row from the same uh, from the same mating. But yes, brown house snakes you can have two or three clutches, and depending on where they're from, you get some really really nice colours. And at the moment, um, their phylogeny is being looked at, and it appears that we have probably another two or three species that need to be described. Um, the ones from um, uh, from the west coast, from up in the Springbok area have these really large pop eyes and uh, many years back they were described as um, the subspecies Mentalis 
and it appears that that will be resurrected soon, and they will be split off from the, from the rest. I'm assuming since they're so closely related in subspecies that they can still hybrid with each other? Uh, but that we don't know. Um, I, I do believe that Mentados would be a full species, and uh, you'd probably find that uh, in, in the wild they are geographically isolated. But yes, there's a likelihood that if you have them in captivity that you would be able to crossbreed them. Is there any venomous that crossbreed over there? We, we do have evidence of uh, gaboon, gaboon adders and the puff that are hybridizing, and we know of two individuals uh, that are with these perfect uh, mixtures, but uh, both were in the wild, uh, in captivity. Um, years back when I was at Transvaal Snake Park, we crossbred the western barred spitting cobra or the zebra cobra, Nodja necrosincta necrosincta. Uh, we crossbred those with uh, the Mozambique spitting cobra, uh, Nodja Mozambica, um, and had um, these sort of perfect mixtures. But um, I don't know what ever happened to that, that progeny, and I haven't heard of anyone else doing it subsequently. Was there any studies done on if it changed their venom at all? No, no, not at all. I think that uh, we have, you know, if one talks of venoms, we have a tremendous amount of work to do still. Uh, we, for instance, now know that Cape Cobras from the Western Cape have a venom that is far more potent than those from further north up in Botswana, probably two or three or four times more potent. Um, and if we look at the Burgaders, for instance, um, at this stage, we're aware of a population in the Cape Fel Fold Mountains down in the Western Cape, a separate population in the KwaZulu-Natal Drakensberg, another population in the, the Mpumalanga Mountains, and then in eastern Zimbabwe up in Chimani Mani, there's another population up there, and uh, Dr. Branch has been looking at their phylogeny, and they will soon be splitting them into four species, but we have no idea what the differences in venoms are. What kind of... Uh lizards and amphibians are there in your area? Ah, we have, a, we have the most incredible lizards and uh, I've been spending a lot of time uh, looking at, at lizards. Of course, uh, the whole group of cordylids was recently revised by Ed Stanley and uh, he split them up into various different genera, but if you look at the, the sort of the giant girdled, 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 girdled lizard or the, the sun gazer, we have the armadillo lizards, um, in the group, we also have uh, all the um, crag lizards of the genus uh, Pseudocordylus. Uh, we have the, the plated lizards of the genus Gerosaurus. We have, really have incredible lizards. And then, of course, the variety of geckos. Uh, we have uh, incredible geckos. And Aaron Bauer has been describing a whole bunch of new ones. But we really have uh, very attractive lizards, uh, geckos that are popular in the pet trade in Germany. Uh, Pachydactylus goody. Um, the, the beautiful Pachydactylus Gaia census from uh, Western uh, Namibia, uh, the barking geckos, uh, oh, there are just so many. We really have really, really cool lizards. On the frog side, we have over 100 species. We have uh, beautiful frogs, uh, the banded frogs, the shovel nose, the bullfrogs. We've got um, uh, all the, the various tree frogs of the genus Leptopelis, um, the reed frogs of the genus Hyperodius. And we really have an abundance of really, really nice frogs. It's so interesting hearing you name off all these. You've probably named more in this chat than we have in our state. Yeah, there's a, that, that, that's very likely. Um, uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, Americans. Uh, my, my, my good friends Paul Muller and Randy Babb come out here uh, very often. Paul comes out once or twice a year and we go burping all over the place. Um, they, they're very... Uh, you know, Paul's speciality is are the fastorial skinks, and just on those, uh, in the genus uh, Scalotes, um, we have 21 species. Um, you know, we have all the, the Acontius and the, and the Tiflosaurus and the Tiflocontius. We have such an abundance of, of reptiles here that um, it really is a reptile paradise. And if you go to the hot spots, places like the Macquiland, uh, northern KwaZulu Natal, up uh, Limpopo and the Zimbabwe border. Uh, we really have incredibly nice reptiles to look at. Oh, I had a question and I forgot now. 
Um, I just want to find a, find a sort of few words, that, Devin. When we when we go on long trips, you know, if we're going to go on a, a two or two or three week trip to Namibia or uh, Namaqualand, uh, Northern Limpopo, to give you an idea of the abundance that we have, is that um, we really start making progress on a trip like that when we have over seventy five species, and on a really good trip we could go well over a hundred species of reptiles. That is amazing. So over in the United States, we've been fighting a lot of uh, possible laws and bans, uh, especially on animals that are or may be invasive. Do you guys have any the invasive animals that weren't originally native there? Well, we're watching that very carefully. Um, the tropical house gecko, Hemidacus mabuia, uh, really started appearing in coastal regions like Durban sort of 30, 40 years back. And they've really gone all over the place. Um, even finding them up in the KwaZulu Natal, Drakensberg, all over, all over Gauteng. But by and large, we regard that as a as a natural invasion. Uh, the only real invasive species we have is the flower pot snake, um, Braminus, uh, which um, is a parthenogenetic snake. Uh, not really problematic. It uh, feeds on ants and termites. Uh, we're finding them all over sort of Durban and Cape Town, and they're beginning to pop up elsewhere. But it's small, and it uh, doesn't seem to be competing with the, the indigenous ones. We were concerned with radiate sliders and there have been reports of them uh, in uh, natural waters but recently with a massive big uh, South African reptile conservation assessment we couldn't really find evidence that they've established well and certainly uh, we have no evidence of them breeding in the wild. But we are keeping a close eye on exotics. You know, there's some of the authorities are concerned about iguanas, boa constrictors, corn snakes, rattlesnakes. Um, I think we probably have over 16 or 18 species of rattlesnakes in captivity. And um, needless to say, with all of these snakes, we're seeing more and more escapees. We're finding a lot of dead and roads, exotic dead and roads. So it's something that we're acutely aware of and watching, but there is no evidence at this stage that uh, any of these exotics, exotics have established themselves in the wild. So be before we started the broadcast, you mentioned that you were uh, coming into the end of your fall and winter's coming. What's your cold temps in winter like? Well, depending on where you are, you know, down in KwaZulu-Natal, it's subtropical. It probably gets to down to about 12, 14 degrees Celsius. But uh, here in the high felt where I live uh, in Pretoria, we get pretty close to freezing. Um, and if you go up into the colder regions like Sutherland, parts of the Northern Cape, up into the mountains, you can go well below freezing, down to even you know, minus 6, minus 8, minus 10. I was curious because here we get, we get down to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit, even colder sometimes in our winter. So that limits a lot of the reptiles we have because we have to have ones that can go into estivation and survive those cold temperatures in their dens. Yes, yeah, so, so, so here in South Africa, even in the high felt where the temperatures regularly get down to, say, just above freezing, two degrees Celsius, um, you find that um, puffaders and pythons actually mate in the middle of winter. So that the temperatures at night drop down to close to freezing, the day temperatures get up to about 20 degrees uh, Celsius, which is a really pleasant day. And snakes like the, the runcles, uh, Hemicatus hemicatus, they become um, largely inactive over winter, but again on a hot day when it gets over 18 degrees Celsius, they will come out and bask. And uh, with them being really dark in color, they can get their body te temperatures up to about 30 degrees Celsius on a hot day. What's the largest snake in your area? Our, our, the Southern African python um, gets up to just over 5.5 meters. Um, it's, people often exaggerate and talk about 6 meter plus pythons, but that doesn't really happen. And then uh, black mambas, if you look at the literature uh, and in my books, we talk of 4.5 meters. But in the last 10 years or so, we haven't really seen anything over 3.8 meters. So, you know, as is usually the case um, with snakes, you get these reports of really big snakes but most of it is incorrect and just um, people not really measuring them and estimating them and getting the sizes wrong. With our cobras, our snouted cobras uh, get well over two and a half meters, 
And uh, down in the Western Cape, the mole snakes get well in excess of two meters, and uh, they can be really large and powerful snakes. What about the smallest snake? Those would be the little thread snakes or worm snakes. Some of those um, yeah, maximum size are probably just over 10 centimeters. And then the uh, little dwarf adders, um, the macro adder, uh, Bitter Schneideri, they're really small. They average about 15, 18 centimeters for, uh, for adults. It sounds like you live in a completely different world than us. Well, Devin, it's a, it's a reptile paradise. You know, if guys want to see some really amazing stuff, um, the, the distances are a problem because you've got to travel quite far from uh, Johannesburg to get into really good habitat. And um, we obviously have uh, restrictions on, on collecting. So a lot of the areas that are very strict on uh, or what one collects, but you can always go out there and photograph stuff. But we really have some beauty, beautiful areas, even if you're not seeing a lot of reptiles, which you, I'm cert certain you will. But we have beautiful habitat, um, really a nice country to visit. What are your hot temperatures like in summer? In um, some of the areas, you know, uh, in most of the areas, uh, 25, 30 degrees Celsius would be common. Um, up in Kharteng, where we live, 34 degrees would be a really hot day. But if you go to the hot areas like uh, parts of Namakwaland, the Northern Cape, or up in Limpopo, or even parts of Mpumalanga, uh, the temperatures could exceed 40 degrees on a really hot day. And that's 40 degrees Celsius, obviously. What kind of... Uh do you guys have things like chameleons and stuff down there as well? Yeah, we have a massive variety on that. Uh, we have uh, two uh, large chameleons of the genus Camellia, the common one being the flat neck chameleon that occurs uh, over an extensive part of South Africa. And then in the west you have the Namakwa uh, chameleon, that, uh, that's a terrestrial chameleon. And um, then on the, uh, you know, largely along the coast and some of the forested areas we have dwarf chameleons of the genus Bradipodium, and we have close on 20 species of those. Uh, beautifully colored, uh, massive variety, um, and uh, some of them have very, very small areas that they inhabit. They might just occur in one single small forest. Now, my society, we, with, with how limited our native species are, and there's not a whole lot of us, there's not really room to have an entomology group and a a reptile group and an amphibian group. So we kind of cover reptiles, amphibians, insects, and invertebrates. Um, what kind of things like scorpions or praying mantis and things like that do you guys have there? Oh, we have we have amazing phasmids. We have a, a large variety of scorpions. Um, some of the you know of the and the genus. Um, um, oh, it's just left my mind now. Um, but some of the boothids are really, really venomous. We have uh, two species that are known to have killed people. Um, and uh, we have a, a large variety of really interesting scorpions um, from the really large Fistophalmus, some of them getting up to 20 centimeters in length. Um, and uh, then we also have some really bad spiders. Uh, if you look at them from a, a human danger point of view, we have a, a variety of button spiders uh, we have the violent spiders, we have sack spiders, um, and although some of these have inflicted some some bad bites, um, they haven't really accounted for any human deaths that we know of. But, but scorpions probably account for about half a dozen to a dozen deaths every year. Any interesting insects down there? Yeah, we have uh, we have a lot of really interesting insects. Now, for instance, the dung beetles. We have a, a large variety of dung beetles. We have, some of them are um, some of them are terrestrial. Uh, down in Edo, we have a dung beetle that uh, only lays one produces one young every year. Um, so obviously, some of them are on the endangered list. Uh, we have large uh, phasmids. We have beautiful primantis, a variety of species. Uh, so yes, we have a lot of really, really nice insects. Uh, the centipedes, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, millipedes. Uh, some of the diplopods uh, are, um, you know, roll up into little balls. So we have uh, a lot of really nice in insects in southern Africa. 
do you guys do a lot of conservation on those endangered type species? Well, you know, it's it's a big country and we have a lot of stuff. So um, in the next uh, few weeks, uh, there is a butterfly atlas coming out. They've just uh, assessed all the butterflies of Southern Africa and um, given a lot of attention to um, the threatened species. It, it, it's an IUCN initiative run by the Animal Demograph Demographic Unit of University of, uh, of Cape Town. And uh, we've just spent five or six years working on a, a massive reptile atlas where we've assessed every single reptile in, in South Africa, uh, including Swaziland and, and the Situ, well over 300 species. And we've ended up with about 40 or 50 threatened species. And of those, uh, five species uh, will be listed as critically endangered. Um, we already have two extinct lizards in, in, South, in South Africa. So yes, we, we give a lot of attention to, to the threatened species. And obviously something that comes up in uh, environmental impact assessments. Um, so the new, the new reptile atlas that should be asked in the next month or two uh, will then highlight and flag all of those threatened species. Are there any venomous that are endangered there? Yes, uh, our Albany adder, I'm just sure I can't think of all of them, but the Albany adder certainly is on the list of, of critically endangered. Uh, the green mamba um, will be on the list of um, of threatened, and um, the recent uh, DNA studies uh, tell us that the green mamba in South Africa is uh, very uh, diverse and different to the ones from Zimbabwe and further north. So that work needs to be done, but there's a likelihood that our green mamba should should and will be split off as a separate species. And if you look at coastal KwaZulu Natal, there's been a lot of habitat destruction. Um, so the, the numbers certainly are um, under threat. So I know you said there was a lot of collecting rules and field collecting and things like that. Um, what, what sort of laws are there on exports? Because I know I hear you know, things from in the pet trade that are coming from South Africa. Uh, so you must allow some exports. Yes, um, this is a great concern because um, uh, most provinces um, have uh, strict laws prohibiting the export of, um, of reptiles, especially all those uh, listed uh, on the CITES list. Uh, these are reptiles like the uh, sun gazers and the armadillo lizards, all of the chameleons. There is some captive breeding going on and um, some of these animals are going out in captive breeding permits, but uh, there is concern that um, a lot of them are supposedly captive bred but being taken from the wild. And then we still have a fair amount of smuggling, especially reptiles going out to the home show in Germany every year. Um, so the popular smuggling animals are many horn adders, single horn adders, some of the other small adders, the armadillo lizards, the sun gazers. Uh, these animals are fetching very, very high prices. Um, you know, sort of seven, several hundred or even several thousand dollars per animal. So there is um, still quite a bit of smuggling going on with that. And uh, that is of concern, and it is something that the authorities are looking at very seriously. Since you mentioned the armadillo lizards, that's something that a lot of people really enjoy in our pet trade. Um, and we, a few years ago, we used to see them more and more often, but it seems like they're less and less common nowadays in the pet trade. And I, I know I've read a lot of forums where people have tried to breed them because they have live birth, and a lot of people don't have very good luck with breeding those little lizards. Yeah, I think that um, you know some people have, uh, have worked out uh, how to breed them, including the sun gazers. I think Bert Langerwerf was really good at that. He really been there many, many years back. Um, but uh, yeah, it's hard work and the clutches aren't large. You know, you might only have one or two young a year. So um, at the moment in uh, South Africa, I'd be very skeptical about claims of people breeding any numbers of them. Um, the same with barking geckos. I know a shipment of barking geckos went out recently that were supposedly captive bred. And again, I'd be extremely skeptical about that. Um, some of my German friends are brilliant at breeding geckos, and with barking geckos, they find it difficult. 
So even giant ground geckos, uh, Chondrodactylus um, angulifer, um, I don't believe that anyone is really breeding them in any large numbers in this country. If you compare um, captive breeding in South Africa with uh, parts of the USA, Germany, and, uh, and Belgium, for instance, I'd go so far as to say that most of our captive breeding here is still really primitive, and um, it's done on quite a small scale. There are a handful of specialists that are pretty good at it, but no one is really breeding them in any numbers. What are your views on um, kind of captive breeding for conservation, especially with the amount of habitat loss we're seeing in the world nowadays? Devin, I have, I have absolutely no problem with, with animals being kept in captivity. I have no problem with them being bred for the pet trade to supply the demand. Um, there is no evidence in South Africa yet that uh, any reptile can benefit from captive breeding uh, to be reintroduced into the wild. So we have no programs uh, where reptiles are being bred for restocking uh, natural areas. Uh, by and large, if an area has been has habitat problems, a habitat destruction, um, if, uh, if the animals are not there, there's a reason for that. And I think one needs to correct that problem first. Um, even the relocation of reptiles is um, very debatable because the majority of reptiles that are relocated, I think, uh, don't make it. I think there's very high mortality. Um, I certainly prefer snakes to be caught and released uh, rather than being killed. But uh, we have to consider a few things like carrying capacities. Um, if you're going to relocate that snake to another area, that area probably has enough of those snakes or it has habitat uh, problems while you don't have more of them. And then one also has to be very careful with genetic purity. You don't want to relocate an animal far away from where it was found and start mixing up genes. But yes, for, from a captive point of view, I'm totally in favor of uh, reptiles in captivity. I'm fa in favor of them being bred um, to supply other keepers. I think that's a pretty good deal, and that will certainly take pressure off the wild. Earlier you mentioned uh, you were look you, your area was look and different parts were looking at laws for some of the new exotics that have been coming in. Um, I don't know how much you know about the United States. It sounded like you said you had some friends here, but we have, we recently just had a federal ban where both African rock pythons, Burmese pythons, and yellow anacondas can no longer cross state lines. Yes, I've, I've been following that. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of that is very unfortunate. I think it's um, a lot of people are, are ill-informed. Um, in South Africa, my concern is that um, at this stage, it's a bit of a zoo out there with exotics. And as I've already mentioned, we're see, seeing more and more escapees. Uh, we're picking up more bites where uh, I get a call from a hospital where a kid's been bitten by a Western Diamondback rattlesnake and we don't have easy access to antivenom. Then it's a matter of rushing around trying to find which large collector or which zoo does have anti-venom. And um, it gets more complicated than that because the exotic uh, snakes anti-venoms are not registered medicines in South Africa. They regard it as experimental drugs. So our medical aid companies don't um, fund any of that treatment. And we fairly recently had a guy bitten by a cotton mouth and uh, he spent close to 10,000 US dollars on anti-venom which his medical aid wouldn't cover. So there are a lot of issues that are going to need addressing, and uh, our local keepers are going to have to start uniting and um, working out um, how they're going to approach the authorities, how they're going to get support for the industry, how they're going to make keepers more responsible. But uh, at this stage, I think there's a pretty good chance that a 15-year-old kid with no experience can buy a hatchling Western Diamondback rattlesnake or a neonate for uh, probably 10 or $20 and that's bad news. That's uh, not good. Um, we don't need kids bitten by exotics and causing hassles for the pet trade. Wow. Some of our states, not all, um, some of them require for venomous, you have to have a permit, you have to have anti-venom for that specific species on hand if you're going to have it. Um, 
it, it, we get a we get kind of interesting over here with the fact that we have our federal rules, and then each state has their own rules, and each city has their own rules, and the county that the city's in may have its own rules. There's a lot of rule checking to, to do over here before you get any kind of animal. Well, you know, here we have uh, we have sort of a federal law uh, that's governed by the state vet, but they're more concerned with the with the diseases coming in. Um, so they require uh, for imports they require a quarantine period of usually 30 days in a in an, an approved quarantine facility. But a lot of stuff is being smuggled in, and once if you smuggle something here, once it's here, it's sort of okay. There's no recourse. Then we have our provincial laws. We have nine provinces, and that's a bit of a mess because. Before 1994, we had uh, we had four provinces, so those laws are all uh, a bit of a mess at this stage. And then we also have city bylaws, which um, r can restrict the keeping of, of venomous snakes. So between all of this, um, it, it really is messy, and I would be totally in favor of uh, venomous exotics uh, would, should require a permit system. They should require that the keeper has a certain amount of experience and that that keeper has his own uh, supply of anti-venom or, uh, you know, if a few of them want to pool uh, their resources and, and uh, collectively have anti-venom on hand, but uh, that I think is a prerequisite and my fear is that it's only a matter of time before a deadly exotic is going to escape and some kid is going to get bitten and that's going to be a catastrophe and will have massive repercussions for the trade and if we're not careful it's going to happen and it's going to happen quite soon. I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot about South Africa, but do you guys have any uh, neat zoos over there that do any captive breeding and maybe trade animals between other zoos or keepers? Well, as far as reptile goes, it's, um, you know, well, our big snake park, Durban Snake Park, closed, as, well, the two big snake parks, Durban Snake Park closed uh, six or eight years back, Transvaal Snake Park, which was an excellent facility with a brilliant track record for captive breeding. That closed many years back. So at the moment, we have uh, two zoos, Johannesburg and Pretoria, that have a, a, a small reptile section. We have um, a, about a half a dozen snake parks, um, most of them privately owned, scattered all over the place. And most of them aren't very uh, involved in captive breeding, but uh, one or two or three of them are very involved in, in trading reptiles. So, no, at the moment, uh, I cannot say that we really have great facilities that produce a lot of captive bred progeny and that are very involved in, in inter-zoo exchanges. Uh, from what you just said, it sounded like at one point you had these great snake parks. Was there something specific that caused them to close? Yes, well, Transvaal Snake Park was, uh, was uh, in a very nice area between two major cities established in the, in the 60s. And um, back in the late uh, 70s, they expanded and, and, and created one of the best facilities in the world. And that was um, largely with the help of Carl Switak, who, were, who befriended the owner, Rod Patterson. And between them, they designed a really state-of-the-art facility. And um, this facility produced a lot of uh, you know, very important species. They had a really good captive breeding program. But then, uh, as time goes on, the area became more and more commercial. and um, then about 10 years back, they got to a stage where the land that the park was built on became far more valuable than the going concern. And the park was actually sold off just for the land, and the facility was closed down, and um, we don't really have a state-of-the-art reptile facility in South Africa at this stage. Is there any plans to add one? Uh, not really in the short term, um, and the one reason is uh, if you look at our tourism and, and our population, we don't really have the sort of visitor figures that could justify a state-of-the-art facility. If you, for instance, look at um, the Durban area, we have a new, uh, a fairly new aquarium facility there called Ushaka, which is really one of the nicer facilities you'll see in the world, but they need massive, massive funding on a monthly basis to keep it going because we just don't have enough tourism to make it viable. And when I say massive funding, you're probably looking at uh, a few million dollars a month that is needed just to keep the doors open. Uh, 
Okay. Well, when I was looking up some of your books, there's a, a police book I found also under your name. Did you write that one as well? Sorry, I missed that. What book, what book was that? When I was looking up some of your books, there was a book about the police in Africa. Did, did you write that one as well? No, not at all. In my youth, uh, soon after school, I did have a brief career in the police, and I was a, a knock. I was in the narcotics department for a, for a few years, which was pretty tough because I, I kept on running into some of my good friends all the time, and uh, yeah, that didn't last very long. Did that brief career choice there uh, kind of give you a sense of, you know, some of the needed laws that you may need now for some of these exotic creatures? Yeah, you know, to a lesser degree. Um, I, I, you know, I think um, they were good days. You know, I'm talking of many, many years back, uh, back in the late 1970s. And uh, in those days, um, in the Narcotics Bureau, we were concerned with, uh, with, a, with dope and uh, with some sort of scheduled drugs, but we didn't really have a big drug problem. Uh, things have changed dramatically. You know, it, uh, we have a massive drug problem. We have a massive crime problem in South Africa. Uh, we have problems with our judiciary, so things have really gone south. Um, I, I recall that um, as a drug squad cop back in the 70s, I could actually go out at night and, and work without a firearm. You know, today, uh, there's no way in hell that you could go out as a policeman without a bulletproof vest and a, a really high-powered firearm. So, yeah, things have changed, and uh, it was good at the time, but uh, I don't miss it. Do you have any uh, poaching-type issues of any animals over there? Yeah, we have, we have massive poaching problems, enormous. So, uh, you know, the big, the big deal right now is rhino poaching, where we're losing uh, four, five, six hundred rhino a year to poachers. Um, it's become very sophisticated. A lot of the poaching is done from unmarked helicopters. The poachers have high-powered firearms with silencers. Uh, I think last week we had three poachers killed by uh, the conservation authorities in the Kruger National Park. Elephant poaching is a big problem. Um, mammal poaching just generally is an enormous problem. But we're also having more and more problems with the poaching of, of snakes. Uh, we have a lot of collectors going out catching uh, the valuable snakes like berg adders and uh, single horn and many horn adders. And, um, you know, if you go into the right area, I can catch you 20 or 30 horn adders in the morning or 20 or 30 berg adders in the morning. And uh, berg adders in Germany are fetching up to like a thousand US dollars per berg adder. So it's a lucrative business. And um, we've had a few busts recently. We have a uh, a few very well-known suspects. Their names have been circulated well to all of our borders and all of the conservation authorities. But despite that, they're still poaching on quite a large scale. Sounds like you're dealing with a lot between the poaching and the smuggling. Uh, a lot of the stories we hear about smuggling lately uh, seem to be based around a lot of rare turtles and tortoises for the reptile trade. Um, have you guys ran into anything like that or what kind of turtles and tortoises are in your area? Yes, that's another big problem. We have, uh, we have amazing tortoises. We have uh, you know, probably the largest diversity of land tortoises. And uh, the popular one amongst those for the pet trade are obviously the little um, patlopers of the genus uh, Homopus. So a lot of the Homopus, especially Signatus, they're very popular in the pet trade. They're uh, really small when they hatch. They're half the size of a sort of a matchbox. And... Um, uh, locally abundant, um, so quite easy for you to go and find a dozen or two of those in the morning. Some of the ten tortoises of the genus Samobates are really popular in the in the pet trade, so those are also being smuggled. And sadly, a lot of these um, tortoises occur in very similar habitat to um, some of the rare lizards, uh, like um, the armadillo lizards. So while they're out there looking for armadillo lizards and they're looking for giant ground geckos. They, and uh, some of the smaller adders, uh, coral cobras and shield cobras, they're also collecting uh, tortoises at the same time. I've read on some forums and things that a lot of people speculate, you know, smugglers pick up turtles and tortoises all the time because of how slow they, they may move. Do, do you think that has part of why they're collected so much? 
No, not really. You know, the fact that they move slow is not the issue. They they very often, you know, when it's too cold or too hot, they're hiding under rocks. So you can, in the macro land, you can flip a rock and, and find six speckled uh, putlopers, Hamopus signatus, under one rock. Um, as I said earlier on, they're locally abundant, and if you're in the right area, um, you can collect 20, 30, 40 speckled uh, putlopers in one morning. What about amphibians over there? Um, we talked a little bit about frogs, but like things like salamanders and others like that. Do you guys have a? We we've been seeing a lot of lower numbers due to. They think a lot of it is pollution, just because of how sensitive they are with their skin and uh, what they can absorb through it. Yeah, look, we 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 um, we only have frogs in in, in South Africa. Uh, once you start going up into northern Mozambique, you start finding the odd Sicilian, but we don't have any newts or salamanders. And uh, yes, that is a big problem. Uh, pollution. They are a very good uh, bioindicator of uh, the purity of your environment. So frogs do go first, and um, a lot of habitat is destroyed. But the other big problem, of course, is the fungal infections that have been uh, impacting on frogs very severely, and our frogs are under massive pressure. There's a lot of chytrid fungus in, in the frogs, and a lot of the populations are under threat. So we have a, a number of frogs that um, that we are concerned of, uh, with. You know, some have uh, uh, limited ranges, like Pickersgill's reed frog, Hyperodius Pickersgilli, and then all of our um, uh, ghost frogs, for instance, they live in uh, small streams up in the mountains and those areas are extremely sensitive um, often polluted with insecticides, herbicides and uh, just general habitat destruction. We have a few environmental factors that have we've seen cause frogs to grow extra appendages. Have you seen any of that over there? Yeah, yeah, we have uh, we do see it. Uh, I don't see a lot of it but uh, even 30 years back, I was catching frogs with five legs in some of the areas, and even in very pristine habitats like uh, Golden Gate National Park, I found a, a river frog with five legs. So yeah, we're seeing a bit of that, but not a not a great amount of it. One thing I always like to look for and hope someday I find when I'm out field herping is a a two-headed snake. Have you ran into one in the field? No, I haven't. Uh, I've seen uh, very few uh, two-headed reptiles, but I've seen the odd captive two-headed snake and, and two-headed lizards. In fact, one of our favorite stories is uh, Wolf Harker, who was one of our, you know, one of our prominent herpetologists, was at Transvaal Museum, and a lady came in with her son with a two-headed skink, and he put it on his table, and it sort of skittled and disappeared between some bottles on his desk, and he pulled his chair back and he said to everyone, just stand back. And as he stepped back, he crushed the both heads with the heel of his shoe. So that was a pretty cool story. No, we don't see a lot of them. Okay. Well, I, it looks like I've kept you for about an hour now. Is there anything else that you find relative to our discussion before I let you go? Uh, Devin, no, I think just, you know, it's just sort of in summing up, it's been great chatting to you. It's a uh, we. South Africa has a, an amazing diversity of herpetofauna. It's a fantastic country to visit. Um, you know, it'd be nice if more and more herpetologists go to the effort of getting out here and seeing stuff in the wild, and you know, not, not filling up their bags and smuggling everything back home, but just coming out here and enjoying it. So, I really hope that uh, the guys can make their way here. It's a cheap country to visit. Uh, the distance is a problem. You've got to do quite a bit of driving. But if you do it well, it's, it's still is a safe country to travel in. And, uh, you know, having, having traveled to many, many countries, having herped uh, in a lot of states in the USA, and I've visited, I've visited well over 30 states in the USA already, and I really think that South Africa has a lot to offer to people keen on their reptiles, and they should consider visiting us. Well, great. That's awesome. Uh, I think a lot of my members will learn a lot from this. Uh, it's great with technology that, you know, we can be – pretty much all the way across the world and still have a nice little chat like this and share it with so many. Yeah, uh, just in sort of wrapping up as well, I, I try and post my field trips, uh, I post uh, trip reports on my my website, it's uh, johanmaray.co.za, so your members are very welcome to have a look at the website and they can see some of the interesting places that we've been to.
Definitely, and uh, you know, I can message you and get some of the links for the websites and everything. Great, let's do that. Many thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. Yourself. Nice chatting to you guys. Cheers. Bye.